So, welcome to the last talk of WordCamp Boston 2017. All right, you made it! Yes! I know that Corey asked you how your brains were doing. How are they really doing now? <laughs> You're almost there. We're almost there. Yes. So, um, today we're going to talk about creating great content and how to blog like a boss. And first, we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to blog like a boss. You know, what it means to be the boss of your, of your blog. Um, the first question I always want to answer for people is, who am I to talk about content? Um, my name is Aileen McDonough, and I am the chief executive and writer. I like to call myself a wordsmith sometimes, um, of 3 a.m. writers. Our company's been around for 10 years, but before that, I was always a word girl. I was always a word geek, and so I've been writing and, and, and playing with words ever since, um, ever since I had them. So um, the past 10 years, we've been working on um, providing great content for all different companies in the area, um, Rhode Island, Boston, and, and beyond. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. And where are you all coming from? How many, let's see, let's have a show of hands. How many people are already blogging? Okay, so we have. Um, how many people are blogging for yourself? And how many people are blogging for other people? Love it. Ghost writers in the house. So I also blog as um, Honda Mama for WeHeartHonda.com. And um, so that's me. That's, that's, that's what I do. So what I like to say is that your website is about what you do. And we saw a lot of that in the, the, um, the SEO talk and some other talks here. You know, your website is supposed to talk to people about what you do. But your blog is about who you are. Now, that could be who you are as a person if you're blogging for yourself, or it could be about, you know, who you are as a company. You know, a blog is a great opportunity to show the personal touch behind your company so that, you know, while you've got your great list of services and that's, that's wonderful, you know, it's a chance to reach out and actually develop a relationship with your readers, i.e., your buyers and your potential customers. So what we want to do is we want to be the boss of our blog. Anybody see um, Devil Wears Prada? Yes. Right? Yeah. So we need to just walk up to our blog and be like, I am the boss of you and we're going to get this done. So I love acronyms and I love making up words. So what I always say to people is that you want to blog with PEP. You're going to blog with purpose, efficiency, promotability, and personality. And yes, I put an extra P on there just for fun. You want to blog with purpose because maybe you do blog just for fun, but raise your hand if, if maybe you're blogging with an actual purpose in mind. Now raise your hand if you just blog for fun and it's totally, yeah, nobody's blogging for fun. <laughs> it can be fun, we can make it fun, but the reality is that we all have a purpose. This is not just your inner life, your diary that you're putting up on, you know, on, on, online every single day. Um, you also want to blog with efficiency, because if you aren't efficient in how you blog, you will very soon stop blogging, because it's just too hard to create the content. It's a lot of work. You want to blog with promotability. That means that, again, related to your purpose, you want to make sure that you're creating content that helps you promote what you do. Now, sometimes people will mistake that to mean that they have to have a lot of salesy content on their blog, and that's not what you want, because you want your blog to feel you know, personal, but you you are promoting something, so it's it's okay to admit that and to put a few things in there that that feel a little bit promotable. And personality, this is where your personality has to shine through. You can't be blogging and being boring. No one will read it. And believe me, if you're blogging for somebody else and you're blogging for a you know a company and maybe you're blogging about something like accounting, like snooze, like you have to make sure that you're making it interesting and letting your personality shine through. So how many here feel like, oh, I just, I know we have some bloggers here, but how many people here feel like, oh, I just don't even know how to write a blog. I just don't even know how to get started. Yeah, oh, two. You ready to learn? Sure. Last talk of the day, people. Gird your loins. <laughs> so what I like to talk about is the anatomy of an effective blog. First piece of an effective blog is your title. 
and that's something that was also talked about in the last um, in the last talk was you know title tags, and this is related to that because your title has to be good. Um, very often, I will be working with a client, and they will put a title, and it's it's so funny because they'll put a title that to them sounds absolutely wonderful, and it's got tons of jargon in it, and it's got tons of key words in it, and there, and and then I'll take a look at it and say, well, you know, instead of um, you know logistical complaints in the arena of um, <laughs> you know blah blah blah, what if we just said? Um, how to think like an entrepreneur. <laughs> so you have to think about your title. And what you want to do when you think about your title is you want to you want to use your keyword in your post title. That's another thing that was talked about in the last um, in the last talk. Um, there's a pattern to how Google sees things. And you don't want to keyword stuff your blog. You don't want it to read like Hi, we are so fabulous at producing blogs, and if you want to blog with us, then you should make sure that you read our blog to find out more about blogging. That's no good. But you need to make sure that your keyword is in your post title, because that's the only way that search engines are going to know what your blog is about. So when you have a post, you want to put your keyword in the post title. Also, test your titles. And this has been a theme that I have been seeing throughout the past couple days. Test, test, test. See what works. We, we, you have the technology. We can see what's going on in, in the back end of our WordPress blog. So you can see which, you know, which titles are getting more excitement and more engagement. So test them. See which works. Think to yourself, how will people search for this info? You know, why, why are they on here? How are they going to find it? I'll tell you something. I, one of the clients that I work with is a car dealership, and. Um, they originally um, hired me on because um, they they wanted to reach women, and so what they did was they developed um, a YouTube channel with a really cute young girl showing people um, showing people cars. Um, you have to know your audience. Um, that's a big thing. I, I said, well, you know, did. Why did you particularly think that that would work for reaching women? Because they were surprised because the main people they were reaching were um, young guys. And, um, and they were surprised at that. And they said, well, because there's a woman in it. Um, I said, that, that's great that there's a woman in it. But just so you know, you, you really do have to think about, you think about your users. And we, so what we ended up doing was we, we created a blog. And because historically men tend to be visual, that's why they like certain mediums of um, expression. And um, women tend to be readers, which is why Fifty Shades of Grey was so popular. So a blog was more, for their audience, a blog was an appropriate way to, to try and reach women. And so we, and we found that one of the biggest titles that, that attracted um, engagement was how to, how to anything how to, you know, change a tire, how to get, you know, how to get the most out of your gas mileage, how to um, pair your iPhone with your, you know, with your hands-free link on your Honda, it's a Honda, Honda dealership. So that was something that we learned, and so now every single month or every other, every other week, we're making sure we've got a how-to blog in there. It's always going in there. I'll take questions at the end, I promise. Yeah, no, no, we'll definitely have time for questions. No worries there. Um, okay, so as you, you know, now we've got the title, and now we actually have to start to write. Oh, God. First, just take it piece by piece. Just do the next thing. First thing is the intro, and that's why are we here. So you want to get a hook. You want to get people excited. Asking a question is a great way to start a blog, and it's also a great way to get your keyword in that first paragraph, ideally in the first sentence. Again, it's about creating that pattern. We don't want to keyword stuff. We just want to have a pattern. And Google really, really likes, and other search engines also really like, when you have your keyword in the first paragraph, in, and even in the first sentence would be your ideal. So asking a question is a great way to, to make that happen. You want to draw the reader in and get excited. Think about what you would be excited about if you were reading this blog. Now we get into the meat of the subject, the body of the blog. And this is what are you telling your reader? What are you telling us? You know, are you going to try and give them information? Are you trying to help them learn a skill? 
Um, are you trying to sell your product? I mean, that's a great way to, to get your, to explain your products is, is use a blog and talk about how to use it. Um, this is the meat of the blog, and this is where you can really, you know, you can really get some great um, search engine optimization. And also it's just really draw your reader in. Once you've got the meat down, you want to make sure that your closing is helping to promote either your blog or your product or whatever you're trying to get across here. So you want to circle back to the intro. This is another keyword opportunity. You want to mention your keyword. You want to have a call to action. You know, you want to know what you want them to do. And even though, remember, even though we're aligning ourselves with what our users want, we also want them to do what we want them to do. We have to train our users a little bit, train our customers and our readers. So the call to action should be worded in a way that's exciting for the user and also, but it's going to get them to do something that you want them to do. Call, contact, set up a consultation, or read more blog articles. Also, you want to have some actionable steps. Now, this is slightly different from call to action. And this is just, to me, you know, blogging is not just about keyword stuffing and, and putting a bunch of stuff up there for, for um, SEO. I truly believe that you know, we all now have this power to be publishers, so why not publish good content? Why not be part of putting good stuff out there? So when you give readers a bunch of information and you have your own call to action, you know, don't be afraid to include some actionable steps for them. You know, for their own edification and for their own benefit. Things that will help them as related to your subject. One thing I like to do with my um, clients is we have what I call a shirt tail. And it's just a little blurb that describes your purpose and contains your calls to action. And so when you have this language kind of already set up and vetted and you know that it works, this is something you can just tack on to each one of your blog articles it's there when you need it, and you know it just makes it easier. You know, it's just just keeping your head. You got to make sure you put that little shirt tail on the end, and to, to help people come back to um, to what you want them to do. Okay. So blogging with efficiency often includes some planning. I know that stuff because we want to be so spontaneous and we just want to sit down and let the muse kiss us on the forehead and everything is going to work out just fine. But the reality is that you want to do some planning. The best blogs are a mix because they've got the spontaneous stuff that's going on and then they also have stuff that's planned out. So your editorial calendar is going to help you to do that. Um, there's lots of ways to, to create an editorial calendar. There's actually a WordPress editorial calendar plugin and this links to that and I can, I'm, well, honestly, I'm sort of afraid to go off this because of our earlier technical difficulties. But it's very easy to use and if you just Googled WordPress editorial calendar plugin, you'd find it and you could put it on your, your blog and use that. That's integrated into your blog. If you are the kind of person that wants more of a, a sort of high level view, then a spreadsheet is probably the way to go. And if you go to my blog at 3amwriters.com um, and, and look for, um, there's a there's a blog that I wrote called Stunningly Sim Simple Content Calendar, then you'll be able to download your own content calendar. And it's, again, it's stunningly simple. It's very simple. Um, and it's a good way to start if you haven't been doing a content calendar yet. And then there are all sorts of great things. And I'm even learning about more, so I'm excited. There's going to be a lot more good um, content calendar apps and plugins. So the reason that you want a content calendar is that you, um, I always say that Christmas comes once a year and it comes at the same time every single year. And it's the same in your business, in your company. There's things that happen every single year in your company and it always happens at the same time. And yet, every year you're trying to blog about it and suddenly it's October 29th and you're going, oh my God, I have to blog about Halloween. What, wait, where did, that, where did that come from? Because you know, we get so busy in our businesses, we get so wrapped up that we, we don't always see everything happening around us. So anybody who's in retail knows that if you want to talk about Halloween, like we're, they're already starting now. Like if you go to Target, there's already Halloween candy out. So you don't want to start too early, but you want to think about the people that you're talking to and, and you want to be ahead of that curve instead of in the middle of it getting like tsunamied. So 
you want to make sure that, you know, when you have these ideas that, you know, come around once a year and, and, and are tried and true, that you have them on your calendar so that you can actually do something about them. So, being that a blog is the basis of your content strategy, and every single, it's amazing, because every single talk that I've been to, no matter what they're talking about, at some point, they've mentioned that content is king. And it absolutely is. Content is king. So, if you are going to have the blog as your basis for a content strategy, which is a great, efficient way to do it, then you need to be thinking every time you post content. Where can we expand on this idea? Where else can it go? And how do we need to tweak it to go there? So that's when your efficiency really kicks in. So that instead of just writing one blog post, you're actually ending up writing three. So an example of that would be, for instance, something I just did actually for an account, accounting firm that I, that I work with. Okay, so we did, we were talking, I was talking with the, the accountant about, you know, how to make accounting exciting, which, let me tell you, we can do it. We can do that. Anything can be exciting. But I say that, but I also, I say that and I'm joking, but accounting really is exciting. In fact, you know what's really exciting about accounting? The fact that you can hire someone else to do it. Yes. <laughs> that is the most exciting thing about accounting that I know. So our blog and our website is always talking about hiring us, what we can do, all the services we can do, you know, we can provide. But also we like to do other things that, you know, are good for, you know, it's, it's ex the things that are exciting for our, um, you know, for our readers. So we do a, um, so we do series. A series is a great way to get a blog, like to get a lot out of a blog. So we recently did a series that started with a discussion I was having with the accountant on entrepreneurs. She was working with a lot of entrepreneurs, and she was like, how can we really talk to them? You know, how can we, and also, how can we start to discern, you know, who I'm working with who's an entrepreneur, and who is really not, you know? So we started to talk about that, and so we are doing a series, we just started it, called The Five, you know, How to Think Like an Entrepreneur. And so we started with, you know, the five, five elements that every entrepreneur has, even though there's no typical entrepreneur, we came up with five elements that every entrepreneur has and with an entrepreneurial mindset. And that exploded. We ended up with, we're gonna, that's gonna yield probably 20 articles because there's so many places you can go from that. First of all, we have the initial article. Then each one of those attributes is going to be its own blog article. So we're going to go through each one of those attributes, describe them more, talk about how to integrate them into their lives. Then we're going to pick out certain, um, you know, certain clients that she has that really exemplify these attributes, and we're going to do a profile on them. So now how many do we have so far? We've got one, then we have the five each, we've got six, now we do five more profiles, 11, not a numbers girl, we're a girl. And you know, now we're gonna get a dozen blogs out of it. We're gonna get a dozen blog posts out of it. And as, I, as we do more, we're gonna get more. And that's the other thing. You wanna make sure, you wanna sort of, you wanna get yourself to the point where you think like that all the time. And you're thinking, you know, when you're writing a, a blog article and you're like, wow, this is really too long, I should cut some stuff. Don't just cut it, dump it into another article. There are so many angles that you can take on everything you do. So then, you know, we can even go the other way and say, how do you know if you're just not an entrepreneur? How do you know if you're, you're, if that's just not your thing? So there's a lot of different ways that you can take any article. Any article, any article you write can end up being three articles. Does anyone want to name an article that they've written? And I can tell you how we can make more articles out of it, like rabbits. Anyone? Well, I just described one. Maybe later. <laughs> so, whenever you post content, you're always thinking, okay, where can we go with this? Okay. You also want to make sure that you're using all the great plugins that are out there. Jetpack is wonderful. Everybody's probably using it already, so that's easy. Um, but the other thing is, if you want your blog to, if you want to work with some, some really good efficiency and make sure that you're being efficient with your blog, 
very often what people will do is they'll get really frustrated because they feel like they have to choose between a blog and an e-newsletter. And I'm here to tell you that you don't have to. You can have it all. You can have both of them. You can be like Mary Tyler Moore and you can just have it all. Now I'm really dating myself. I'm actually not that old. My mother watched that show. Um, so I like to use MailChimp because it's free. And as we've heard many times today, free is in everyone's budget. Um, MailChimp has automatic e-newsletter updates. So people subscribe and they get they get an e-newsletter right to their right to their inbox. So if you're feeling like you're strapped, stressed, you don't have a lot of time, then you know down you know get the Mailchimp plugin and set it up so that people will get not only your blog but an automatic e-newsletter. So that's a little trick that you can that you can use, and it's very nicely integrated with WordPress. I know that Constant Contact is as well, so I don't want to play favorites, but I've used um, I've mostly mostly used on Mailchimp. So. An effective blog is also very promotable. You know, when when you're on social media and you're thinking, oh God, what do I say to all these people on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, your blog answers that question. You know, you can grab little snippets out of it. You know, you can you can put it out there. You can you, you can use it to create visuals. Visuals are amazing. Like that's. Um, you know, you want to make sure you have your social media lead-ins. You want to have all of that going back to your blog because you don't want it just on social media because you want to make sure that people are coming back to your blog and you own all that content because the reality is that if all your content is on social media, you never know. I mean, they could do anything with it. Suddenly they make it paid. Some, someday Mark Zuckerberg wakes up and says, you know, I don't think I want to run Facebook anymore and just pulls the plug. You never know. So you want to make sure that everything is back on your blog and going outward from that. Um, I have a, a little um, app that I absolutely love or plug in and try to think of how you would put it, but it's called Click to Tweet. It's fantastic. And it's really good too for those of us who are not visually inclined, like those of us who are word people and we like to write, but we don't necessarily like to create pretty things for people to look at. Um, a Click to Tweet, actually, you can, you can put it, you can, you can download it in your, your WordPress backend and it will, you can create I, it creates like a little, a nice little box. I feel like I want to show it to you, but it makes me a little nervous. Okay, it creates, it creates a, a nice little box with a nice little quote in it, and when your readers are reading it, they just click it and it tweets. So it's wonderful because it's going to give people a way to share your blog for you. Let them do the work, and it creates a nice little visual to break up your words. The other thing is those of us who are not visually inclined, what I encourage you to do, I mean, how many people here are, are absolutely word people and all they want to do is write, they don't want to do anything visual? One, thank you. <laughs> no, you can use quotes from your blog in a visual medium and that still counts as a picture. So what I did was I had a wonderful designer um, colleague that, that I work with create just two nice little templates with my, you know, my branding all on it, and we just drop quotes in those little templates and we put them out there all the time. So that's what we start to use on social media, and you get more eyeballs and people come to your blog. Okay. So those of, those of you who um, were in, in the previous talk, you can take a moment and think about your shopping list or how you're going to get home and stuff like that. But any blog, any blog worth writing is a blog worth optimizing. And this is where you need to use your keywords. Don't keyword stuff. Follow the guidelines I provided. Um, make sure that you've got your tags. We learned in the last one that Google is you, Google reads those tags. Like that's what they read. So you want to make sure that you've got a good title tag. You want to make sure that you've got your good alt tags in there. And you want to make sure that your blog has categories so it's clear where it's going, what it's coming from. Um, I tell people you really, a good rule of thumb is um, five categories total and no blog should be assigned, no, no blog post should be assigned to more than two categories. If you are assigning your blog to more than two categories, then you actually have several articles going and you need to break it up. So, and then we have meta and title tags and rich snippets. Um, where that's, you know, that's the back end stuff. So if you're, you know, you're writing your content, you want to make sure that your meta and title tags have nice, clear titles. You want to tell Google what this blog post is about, make it nice and easy for them to figure out 
and and if you can do that piece of it, then that's really what you need to be thinking about for your snippets. Okay. Images are a big deal, and Yoast. If, how many people here use Yoast? Okay. So you know that when you're in the back end and you're you know tweaking your blog a little bit to get that little readability score up. Does anybody do that? Yes. Make it turn green versus like you know. So one of the big things is always put in the images. And this is where I'm like, oh, I'm not an image person. I'm a word girl. But if you could just sneak an image into every one of your blog articles, you would, you would raise your, your SEO score. So why not? Why not? Um, just make sure you're not stealing images. I taught a class. I, taught, um, I teach a, a six-hour blogging boot camp class. And there's all levels there. And um, I had to explain to somebody that you can't just grab an image on Google and use it on your site. You could get into a lot of trouble. Um, but you can also use quotes in a visual way. And you know, check your industry. If you're working with an industry of, say, retail, they probably have a lot of images that they would be happy to let you use because you're already promoting their product. And also, you know, partner with local photographers. There's, oh, there's so many great local photographers out there, and they're probably looking for people who do what you do. So you can barter with them. You can develop a relationship so that you can get actual photos, not just stock. Stock is great. Yeah. There's a lot of great places to get it, and that's wonderful. But you know what? There's no replacement for just real quality photos if you can get them. And it's, it's accessible. It's possible. Trust me. Just ask around, find a photographer to friend. So, what I want everybody to be able to take away here is 10 easy blog ideas. And this, these slides will be available, so you will be able to get them. You don't have to furiously write them down. But if you want to take a picture of the screen, go ahead. And I can actually show you some examples of them too, but I want to make sure you get your screens in. pictures. We can go back to this and, you know, I can bring up some examples, but again, we're having the tech thing, so I just want to make sure we're okay and get the real first. Okay, so, bonus idea. If you just looked at that slide just now and said, oh, I've already done all of those blog articles and this is so lame, I need some new ideas, um, go bilingual. If you have a bilingual audience, or if you think you might, write some blog articles in another language. You know, it, this is again. I mean, you can use their transposh is a is a um, a translating you know mechanism that you can use, or like again, find a person. Like I want to encourage you all to to know that there are other people out there who are who may be interested in your blog and may be interested in helping in exchange for something else. Maybe you never know. But if you can find someone else who you know, if you have someone in your market who's interested in what you do and also speaks another language, then, you know, utilize that contact and, and write a few of your blog articles in a different language. Um, just make sure that your titles are in the correct language. That is really important because for Google will pick it up and Google loves, loves to see bilingual um, content. So that's another thing to, to consider depending on your market. Oh. Does anyone have any questions? We're at 10 minutes. Yes. There's, a, oh, this lovely lady is going to bring around a, oh, there's a mic right in the middle. This is not that, yeah, perfect. See, teamwork. Oh, good. Thanks. Um, I just had a question about, like, the photos. Um, I'm, not too sure, I'm not too sure what fair use means. Because, like, for instance, if I want to write an article about a famous like singer that I really admire um, and I need a photo of, of them like what ways can I do that without me okay so you're asking about images and I'm a word girl so I'm gonna do my best um, this young lady asked uh, what about fair use for instance if she's writing an article about a famous singer like someone who's already got a lot of photos out there 
um, you know, how do you find those images? I'll be honest, you would have to look for the images and then I would look at that particular image where it came from and 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 go from there. And it sounds, do you have an answer for that? Yes. Um, Talk to us. Helpful tool I, tool I just found out about is if you go on Google and then under the search options, you can actually click as a component of image if it's um, able to be reused without copyright and things Wonderful. like that. So then you're awesome. kind of safe on that bet. There you go. So there you go. There's your answer. Yay. Teamwork. Makes the dream work. Any other questions? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. uh, blog link. Anything about blog length, length of the blog? Length. Oh, length. Um, the magic number is at least 300 words. Oh. Yes. So not 299, 300 words. How about on the other end? On the other end, like too long? long? Yeah. Um, depending on your, your market and your audience and your subject, there almost is no too long. I mean, I... That sounds crazy. But a long form blog, in fact, a lot of SEO um, providers or, you know, and experts will say that you need a good mix. So you need your 300 to 500s, and then you want to have your long form blogs, and they're anywhere from, they're like 1,000 words, 1,500 words. Those are good, those are good lengths to shoot for for your long form content. And then you're going on up to, say, 2,000. But if you're into like 5,000, that's called a white paper, and you want to you want someone to either pay for that or you want to get someone's email address for that. So I would say that you know if you're if you're in the 200 or the 2,000 mark, you you probably could cut it down, and again, you could make another blog out of that one, another post about that one. But 300, if if you walk away with nothing else, 300 is the magic number, for at least for minimum. Mm -hmm. Um, my question is about uh, Yoast and the readability score. Mm -hmm. So I write copy and blogs for a more technical audience, mm -hmm. and I struggle with oh, getting yeah. that because my audience is more technical, but the Testify. plugin is telling me that it's, it's got to be fifth grade or yeah. right. And so I always go with okay, I'm gonna write for my audience rather than the plugin. Is that something I should continue to do, or should I still try to play with getting that score to be great? I mean, I would not use that usability, that readability score as as Bible. Like, I would write for your users, and that's another thing. Like, I, in the end, we're writing for people, right? Everybody nod. We're writing for people, not bots. So we, and as as we've learned in this the talk right before us, love that talk. Let me tell you, she was fabulous. Um, Google loves when your users love you. So the more users you can get to your site that's going to positively impact your rankings as well. So if there's always going to be trade-offs. You're never going to have everything perfect. You want to make sure that you've got decent readability, but if you can find ways to boost your readability without sacrificing that content, and I completely understand. I write, um, some, blog, I write some blogs for the New England Journal of Medicine, and you're not writing at a fifth grade level there. I mean, doctors are going to be looking at that, what? <laughs> you know, you're talking down to me. So you do have to consider your audience. And so as they come back to your blog, you're going to, you're going to get the boost there. That's where you want the boost. If it's a choice between a bot and a person, choose the person always and find another way to please the bot. There's, there's tons of ways to do it. So, anyone else? Any more questions? Come on. You're the next contestant on The Blog is King. <laughs> so I was thinking about where earlier you were going to give examples of how one blog post could be spun into like 20 or 30 ones. Talk and to me, hit me up. Well, I thought of one, if we Ooh, could do it. Let's hear it. Um, so recently my company, it's a small nonprofit, mm -hmm. had uh, something like the best th best ways to celebrate the 4th of July mm -hmm. this weekend in our small New England town. Mm -hmm. So what would be some ways that we could spin off of that? Well, I think from there, that's, I mean, that's, you're, you're doing a lot with that blog already, but if you can go from there to think about other ways to celebrate, for instance, people who have dogs don't like fireworks, so you might want to say the safest ways to celebrate the 4th, and then you might want to also go further into each of those. So if you have best ways to celebrate, what are you, you're kind of talking about different um, places that have, 
are you talking about different places that have Fourth of July celebrations, or? So it's just like this really cute, classic, small New England town. So it's kind of celebrating all their local traditions, some of which have been going on for hundreds of years. Bristol, Rhode Island, perhaps? <laughs> Similar, Hingham, Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. So I think I would go into that list, and you could expand on each of those places, even later. It doesn't have to be right now. But for instance, if you did, a, you know, if you did that, and on the list was make sure you don't, you know, don't miss the Bristol parade, then right there, you know, you've got places to stay, you know, before you go to the Bristol parade. Um, ways, you know, what what you should pack for the Bristol parade. What you know, like ways to do it. So each piece on that list could could create more. Or it could be a series, like summertime things to... Absolutely. Because that starts and it sort of like launches you and then you could say, okay, 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day, the summer's full of great holidays that you can use and, you know, different things. So, like, whatever you do, you want to be thinking to the next thing. So, any more questions? Mm-hmm. I don't know if we're talking about different formats of blog here, but could you speak to if you, uh, you know, writing a blog mm -hmm. and uh, and having like hyperlinks to articles on your website and or linking to other articles like Wikipedia, things like that, or uh, bringing other writers in is. is is there value to all that? Absolutely, absolutely. You just want to make sure that when you you code it, that it opens up a new window and doesn't go off of your site. That's a little thing that some people just don't think of, but it's, it's obvious, but it's, it's important. Um, you absolutely want to use your blog to, basically you're creating the web. You know, the web is not a straight line. The web is, you know, a web and everything is cr crisscrossing and connecting. So what you want to do is make sure that your blog, any post you do, is linking to another blog post, is linking to services, is, is if you're talking about contacting somebody, make sure that, you know, that link is there. Get guest bloggers in. You don't, you probably don't want to, uh, you don't want it to be really link heavy. I don't know what the magic number lately is. The, the last magic number I heard on that one was like three to four before it gets a little bit, you know, obnoxious. But um, if you're writing a series, you're going to be linking all over the place. You know, you're going to be linking in the first paragraph, talking about the series. There's going to be a lot of linking going on there. And there's definitely value to it. I think there's definitely value to it. And how many words did you say would be the beginning of a white paper? Um, like around 5,000. Yeah. So, more questions? Hi. Um, I'm working on launching a wellness blog, and um, one of the aspects I want to hit on is a part of it that's going to have recipes. Mm -hmm. And when I've seen other like food blogs that write a whole post and narrative before they do the recipe, it just annoys me. Oh my god, me too. Because I don't care. About, I don't care about your whole story about what you were doing before you were cooking. I just want the recipe, and I just. <laughs> this one, that, have you noticed? For some people, blogging is like dear diary. <laughs> And you're like, I don't care that you're like, yeah, just give me the recipe. I've got 30 minutes to make food. Just stop. Yeah. So I guess I was just wondering, like, is it okay to just do the recipe? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can do the backstory afterwards. You can put that on the bottom. You want, you know what? I bet your, I bet your blog would kick some butt because that, how many people is that a problem for? I just want the recipe. Just give me the flipping ingredients, please. I got hungry people. Yes, absolutely. I think it's a great idea. So, as a solo free freelancer, I find blogging to be a challenge in terms of consistency. You know, you get busy with other things. I hear you. you get the post. So, um, and I struggle with finding enough content. Mm -hmm. So, what are your thoughts on reusing content from other blogs where you might repost it? So you're kind of promoting another mm. blog, but then adding just a small snippet of uh, value add where you're commenting on what they say. And I think WordPress even has a button to do it automatically. Absolutely. I think it's great to do that. In fact, I'm going, oh, I thought, hmm, hmm. well, we didn't have that on that on my easy blog ideas, but that is one of the best ideas because you can just do an excerpt. You know, you can excerpt someone else's article. You can get them to, to do a guest blog. You can do a lot with it. Um, I'm being told that I'm done. There is, um, there is still closing remarks downstairs. Remember, they're going to be auctioning off TV. Blue host, you get excited about that. And
and I will be here for a few minutes if you have any more questions. And thank you very, very much.